Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 203 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing demonic possession in horror books and movies, and I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Grady Hendrix, making his seventh appearance on the show. He's the author of such books as Occupy Space and Satan Loves You, and his novel Horror Store, about a haunted Ikea, is being developed for television by Gail Berman, producer of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. His new novel, My Best Friend's Exorcism, is out now. So, Grady, welcome to the show. Hey, nice to be here. Then next up, we've got Jordan Hammersley London, making her fourth appearance on the show. She's an editorial director at Adaptive Books, and has also been an editor at Grosset and Dunlap and Egmont USA, where she worked with authors such as E.C. Myers, Adam Troy Castro, and Ben H. Winters. So, Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And also joining us today is Paul Tremblay. His novels include The Little Sleep, No Sleep Till Wonderland, and the forthcoming Disappearance at Devil's Rock. His novel, A Head Full of Ghosts, about a reality TV show exorcism, has been optioned by Focus Features, and Stephen King writes that the book, quote, scared the living hell out of me. So, Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Great to be here. Okay, and so when I think of demonic possession in horror, obviously the first thing that comes to mind for me is the movie The Exorcist. So let's start off with Jordan. Just what do you think overall of The Exorcist? I think that my opinions of The Exorcist change as I got older. It was one of those movies where I was told you're not allowed to see it as a kid because it, it'll horrify you so much you'll never sleep again. And so I waited like a good little teenager until I was 17 to see it. And I watched the director's cut that came out in like 2003 or so. And I was just like, oh, this isn't that bad. This is totally fine. I don't get what the big deal is. And now I am no longer 17 and invincible. And hmm. uh, it's much more upsetting. And I, I think that that's um, how I feel about demonic possession narratives in general. Uh, as a younger person who didn't have like a sense of mortality, I was all about it. This is great. These are scary but fun. And now I see that there's a lot more going on than just, oh, are you possessed by the devil? It's why is this happening to this specific person? And so that's kind of always been my thing with um, The Exorcist is like the quintessential exorci exorcism story is why this family and could it happen to me? Yeah, that's really interesting, Jordan, because I had a similar experience. You know, my dad, when I was growing up, told me, oh, this is the scariest movie I ever made. You know, I'll never you couldn't pay me to watch that movie again. So I didn't watch it until I was out of college, I think. And so it was not as scary as I had been uh, built up as I built up in my mind. Um, and I haven't watched it now that I'm older. So maybe I would find it scarier again. But I don't know. Grady, what did you think of The Exorcist? You know, I don't remember when I first saw it, but I loved it from the moment I saw it. You know, I never watch horror movies to be scared. I just, I like the genre, you know, I like the trappings. I like the the blood and the barf and the ghost and the houses mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So I loved it. And I do remember, and you guys are pretty hardcore, like, because I vaguely remember watching it as a teenager. And I remember I was with friends. We watched horror movies together a lot. And the scene where Linda Blair is jamming a bloody crucifix up her, her <laughs> vagina that's hemorrhaging blood and then smears her mother's face across her, her crotch. I don't know, man. I, it didn't scare me, but you guys are like, yeah, whatever. I see that every day on the like seven train. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember we all sort of looked around the room and like we were nice boys from South Carolina and we're like, what? Um, and also, I got to say a little shout out. The book is great. I mean, I, I do feel like The Exorcist is one of those cases where the first big book and the first big movie are pretty much perfect and they kind of cast a shadow on everything that comes after them you know there were haunted house books before shirley jackson's haunting of hill house but there really wasn't a big exorcism book before the exorcist and so it's really hard to get out from underneath it right but grady with the jamming the crucifix of her vagina and stuff i mean a lot of that stuff like the head spinning around and the projectile vomiting was a lot more slapstick to me than i had expected the movie to be <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I am so glad I didn't grow up in your house, dude. Um, you are tough. Um, you no, know, seriously, I, I do. That was the moment, thinking back on it, that really horrified all of us. Because that was the moment when I thought the filmmakers crossed the line. Now, realize, I was watching this in the 80s, so maybe we were all more innocent back then. But I, I had never seen on screen a, a, a person jam their mother's face up their bloody vagina and like i for us we were just like holy crap this movie's gonna go places that we're not prepared for because they're willing to violate a very basic rule about movies having to do with mothers and v their daughter's vaginas well i think it's also <laughs> linda blair was a child yeah well, exactly. I mean, she's a child. And also, The Exorcist is so good because it's a slow build. So by the point you get to some of the freaky stuff, whether you like the movie or not, you're believing the on-screen relationships. You're not sitting there being like, oh, that's Barbara Hershey, that's Linda Blair. Oh, where's Max von Sydow? You're going, oh, that's her mom, that's the daughter. You know what I mean? You're sold on the movie and its relationships by the time this stuff happens. So how about Paul? What do you, what do you think of this stuff? Yeah, it's funny. I, I feel like I, I've had the experience closer to Grady's than uh, yours and Jordan's because uh, I did see the movie. I don't remember exactly when I saw it, but I first saw it in the 80s as well. You know, when I was either, you know, uh, a young teenager or, or just become a teenager. And it, you know, absolutely scared you know the hell out of me. Um, and I find actually now that I'm older, movies definitely scare me a lot less than they used to as a kid. As a kid, I was, you know, a card carrying uh, scaredy cat. I would sleep with stuffed animals around my head to protect myself from the boogeyman. Up until like age, I don't know, up until last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was funny. Uh, yesterday I happened to be randomly talking about The Exorcist with a, with a friend of mine. Uh, Jordan knows Jack Haringa, critic uh, and scholar, we'll call him. <laughs> uh, we talked about how it's, you, can't, you can't really, well, at least it seems very hard to find the actual original theatrical release of The Exorcist. And that what people have been seeing really since the mid to late 90s is the director's cut which I think is less of a movie than the original because the director's cut, I think the stuff that they put in, it makes sense why they cut it out in the first place. I think it takes away from some of the effect of the movie, uh, particularly the, the spider walk scene down the stairs because it's just yeah. so fake compared to yeah. everything else that happens in the movie. So, you know, as a kid, I definitely bought into the transgression and uh, transgression in the film. And like Grady said, I mean, <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that in Northern Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> growing up. That's for sure. Yeah. And, you know, fucking Friedkin, man, like, this is what he does with all his movies. He recuts and re-edits them. It's almost impossible yeah. to see the original versions. It's such a drag. Yeah. I think, you know, director's cuts in general have more content than they should have just because you things are cut for a reason. And I do remember thinking as I watched it for the first time, there were all of these like superimposed demonic images. Yeah. And that took me out of it because yeah. so much of the, the fear for me in these stories in general is the question of, is this real or is this something happening in someone's head or is it abuse or what? And so when you literally superimpose demonic images, you're telling the audience, oh, no, this is real. And that took some of the the energy away from me because it, the question wasn't there anymore. It was understood that I should be thinking this is real. Well, you, you yeah, but I mean... it was real when the head was turning around? Sorry. I mean, I did. <laughs> but I think I it was... You, but it yeah. was... And I think it just was cheesy. I remember right. thinking... No, I it you know so much of great horror films are in the silence and in those quiet moments when you don't know what's happening and so to have a quiet moment where a camera's panning down a hallway but then there's like a creepy demon thing right removes that energy for me well, it's also, you know, I got to say, I, I really agree with you. I really feel like, and this is such an elderly thing to say, but I do think there's a real syndrome where movies are over-directed these days. Like, you have access to so much technology in the editing room and on the set. 
And when you look at a movie from the 70s, they look very simplistic compared to what you have today. And I actually think that works so much better for horror. The more something seems real in a horror movie, the more the more it seems naturalistic in a horror movie, I think the better it is. And I kind of think that's why found footage movies have been such a big thing in horror, is because they're taking away all the directing choices a lot of directors can make now. And it's, here's a camp, you know, Paranormal Activity, another possession movie, kind of. Um, here's a camera on a tripod with a single shot, and it's not going to move. You know, it's... it's um, so yeah, I agree with you, Jordan. Too much directing kills horror. Although I will say, I don't know if you guys will agree with this statement, but I really enjoyed The Conjuring because it felt like it was shot in the 70s. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. They they toned it down. Yeah. yeah there no, were just some like, crazy slow zooms in The Conjuring that just made me feel like I was back in the 70s. Yeah. The problem with The Conjuring is the frickin' Warrens are on screen, Ed and Lorraine, who are, you know, Ed, the self-styled exorcist, who I really hope is burning in hell right now. Just the worst human beings, and it kills me every time one of those movies comes out, because they're not bad, but the fact they're about the Warrens makes me want to set the movie theaters on fire. I was just going to say the same thing, Grady. Um, I'm not going to name <laughs> a name, but I know someone who, uh, I know of a writer who, you know, worked on some of those Warren books and they flat out told them you have to put this stuff in that, you know, that didn't happen. Yeah. It was totally, it was all bullshit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I'm with you. Like I, I had a hard time detaching from that in, uh, uh, in the movie. Well, well and, and Paul, I've heard you say in interviews, the same is true of the exorcist that it's based on a true story. That's also complete bullshit. Yeah. I mean, uh, geez, there's a, I forget the name. I should have looked this up before the podcast. I apologize, but there's a great essay that's included in Centipede Press's um, The Exorcist Study in the Night Films volume. Yeah. Um, and anyway, there's an essay from a journalist who goes back and actually tries to, you know, suss out where this real case came from. And the short of it is he couldn't, he, he concluded that, that the priest who supposedly uh, did it never existed and they couldn't really find the, the, chi- the boy that it was based on either. So, you know, he came to the conclusion that it was all essentially made up yeah, it's it's interesting because it's the um, it's I guess everyone calls it the Mount Rainer exorcism, which actually didn't happen in Mount Rainer. That one back in the forties, it's supposed to be based on. But um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and it's really interesting because Blatty swears up and down, and it was a news story, you know, right. this this exorcism, and Blatty swears up and down that he read the diary of one of the priests who assisted on it, and that's where he got a lot of his stuff, and and I kind of think they're non-exclusive. Like, I actually think that it largely may not have happened at all in any way, shape, or form the way it was reported, but also that Blatty may have read a diary by someone claiming to be there that had all this stuff in it, which is kind of crazy. I mean, it turns into this meta hall of mirrors. (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely. Well, it's interesting, this issue of fraudulence in these possession movies, because, I mean, that comes up. Yeah, like in the ones we just mentioned. And also I watched uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, Mm -hmm. which the whole point of it is, did this really, you know, the the priest is on trial for performing this exorcism where the possessed girl died. And the whole point of the movie is to question whether this thing happened at all. Um, And I just Googled this, the the true, like, quote, the true case that this was supposedly based on. And one thing that jumps out at me is that in the movie, they performed the exorcism for one night. And in real life, it was 10 months. So that that jumped out at me as a pretty major <laughs> major what's, difference. What's, what's Emily Rose based on? Do you remember the case? I, I don't know the yeah, movie. Yeah, it's the um, Annalise and Michelle or something. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Do you do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know that case really well. There's a great German movie. I hate to sound like a pretentious snob, <laughs> but there's a great German movie called Requiem that is about this. And back when I was reviewing movies for the New York Sun, they would give me, I was so low on the totem pole, I reviewed the movies no one else wanted to see. And so I had to go see this movie called Requiem. And I knew nothing about it. I go, I sit in the screening room, start watching. It's this very slow paced art film from Germany about a girl and she's sort of somewhat religious and she goes away to school for the first time. And then it turns into the Annalise Michelle story, like halfway through, and it took me totally unawares. And I got to say, I mean, even to this day, it's not a perfect movie. And if I'd gone in knowing what it was about, I might feel differently. But it was such a powerful experience, you know, to really see 
to be like, oh yeah, of course she's getting an exorcism at this point. Because you see everything that leads up to it. Like, of course she thinks she's possessed by demons from hell. That makes total sense. Uh, it was really interesting. That case is fascinating. Because she participated in it and basically starved herself to death. It's crazy. I describe the exorcism of Emily Rose as a Law and Order movie with an exorcism. <laughs> because I remember sitting in a theater when it came out and, you know, there were the possession scenes and the, the exorcism sequence. But then it was just like scene after scene of just courtroom drama. And it was not at all what I was expecting as the person I was back then who saw every horror movie on opening night. Um, and so I, I would, I don't know how I would feel about it now that I'm older and spooked more easily, but, um, that was my biggest takeaway is like, oh, this is just a courtroom drama with some exorcism bits. Although, is that the movie where they keep waking up at 3.33 in the morning and that's when the devil is around? Yeah, well, it's 3 a.m., but yeah, yeah. 3 a.m., okay, because I, I consistently wake up at like 3.33 <laughs> in the morning and always think of that stupid movie. It's like, that's ah, so funny. the devil's around. This just goes into my overall feelings of how these movies have affected my ability to be <laughs> sane about possession. <laughs> But that's also stolen right out of the Amityville horror, where everyone wakes up at 3.14 a.m. every night, you know, the time yeah. of the supposed DeFeo murders. This stuff just feeds on itself. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was because that's pie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But I, I haven't seen Exorcism Emily Rose, but, you know, it's interesting how many movies that are supposed to be exorcism movies aren't actually possession and exorcism movies. Like, I think the, the Paranormal Activity series and, like, the, the last exorcism movies, the two of those... I don't think of them as possession movies. To me, those are much more um, uh, conspiracy movies. Like, they're like paranoia films, you know, because they both involve cults um, manipulating things behind the scenes. And they're not really about the relationship between the exorcist, the demoniac, and, you know, the people around them. Well, I think that the Paranormal Activity series has grown into something like that with all of yeah. the cults and stuff. That's because that at least in the first initial movie, was nowhere to be found. You're right. You're 100% right. Well, except for the time travel yeah. later. But that, but you don't know that any of that's happening <laughs> in the initial movie. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Movie was just this found footage thing of a woman being creepy and unsettling and doing things when she was asleep that she didn't know she was doing. Right. Well, by the end of it, though, it did turn into, I mean, that was sort of the, the reveal at the end, which, you know, I saw Paranormal Activity, you know, before, you know, sort of the hype machine got going. So I really had no expectations. Did you, uh, what ending did it. you see? Oh, uh, spoiler alert. No, I saw, uh, I saw the ending where, you know, she, you know, at the very end, she goes into the camera and you see sort of like a demonic face. And she jumps. Yeah. Because yeah. there were three alternate endings. Right. Um, I've never been able to talk to anyone who, like, saw... I think they're on the DVD now, but when it first happened, there was like the one where she gets shot at the end by the cops, and then there was one where she slits her throat. Oh. Right. Yeah, I've no, I've no know anyone who's seen those in the yeah. theaters. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. Um, that was the the final moment. I think Spielberg was the one who said she should attack the camera, um, because the story is Spielberg got a copy of it and like put it in a trash bag or something. It freaked him out so much. Um, but said, you know, you shouldn't kill her at the end. She needs, to, the demon needs to win. Um, and so he gave them the idea for that final shot of her looking at the camera. Wait, why, why did he put it in a trash? How does, does that protect you from the movie if you put it in a trash bag? It freaked bag? him out. He was, he was. Trash bags out. are demon proof. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Duh. Double fly. Uh, <laughs> but that's such a problem with horror too, is that the less you know about a horror movie, the, and, and a book too, but, but a book's much more, I think, of a produced object in some extent, to some extent these days. The less you know about a horror movie, the better it is. Like, uh, Blair Witch Project, the first one, or Paranormal Activity, the first one, or, you know, when audiences first encounter The Exorcist, or even like, um, uh, like when I first saw The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that movie didn't scare me because 
of anything that happened in the movie. That movie scared me because I was like, the people who made this movie, something is wrong with them. This is dirty and sweaty and disgusting and, and it just felt vile. And, you know, then once it becomes a franchise and all this stuff, it's like, and you know, you know the release date and you see the trailer and everything. It's less scary. It's, it's more of a, a party. No, I totally agree. In, in a way, you know, I think one of the still, uh, one of the, I guess, the triumphs of the original The Exorcist, the movie, is, you know, there's a movie, you know, obviously it doesn't work for everybody, but commits to it sort of in your face, you know, this is what, this is what's happening. And I do think in some ways, that yeah. would be hard, much harder to do in a film than, uh, you know, than, you know, trying to go, you know, being very ambiguous, you know, which is pretty much what I do with my own work. Um, you know, regardless of the politics of The Exorcist, it sort of stays true to its message, even though if you don't agree with its message. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's something to be said for that. Oh, yeah, I agree totally. I think one of the reasons The Exorcist works so well, both the book and the movie, is Blatty is a believer. You know, right. William Peter, he really believes in God and evil and the devil, and he makes a really good, passionate, reasoned argument for all this stuff. And it's weird to look at possession stuff because you look at where it falls on the scale of how much Christianity is in this possession book. Like, um, Sarah Grant's Come Closer has like, is it one end? Like there's, I don't think there's any religion in that book. Like it's not really posited as this is a, a Christian template. This is a possession. And it has more to do with sort of that character's fears about mental illness and what's happening, their identity. Sure. And then at the other end of that, you've got someone like Ray Russell's uh, The Case Against Satan, which came out a couple of years before The Exorcist, that is super religious. And it's okay. very like, like, it's a terribly boring book because it gets into all these really deep theological, very like minutia kind of things that who really cares about outside the Catholic Church? No, it's funny. It, that book, The Case Against Satan, was just reissued by Penguin Classics. Yeah. An introduction from Laird Barron. And when I read it, it was great. I was, I was totally not expecting <laughs> sort of this, you know, philosophical treaties. Um, but with, you know, there was, I think, some of the proto exorcist kind of stuff that was in there. I mean, to the point where I know, I don't know to what extent, but, you know, there was some legal wrangling between Blatty and uh, the Ray Russell camp for a while. Was was there really? I didn't know anything yeah. about that. That's fascinating. Yeah. What happened? Like, was Russell suing Blatty or... Yeah, I believe so. And I don't know, like, how far it got or, you know, to what extent, you know, uh, I had a uh, a writer for the Wall Street Journal sort of filling me in on this because I had no idea. Oh, wow. The thing about the the case against Satan that I think is so great, because it's a book, it's sort of, eh, it's up and down. It's an interesting read, but, like, it didn't blow me away or anything. But it's got the best chapter titles ever. Like, it sounds like a, a like, Iron Maiden concept album. It's like Inter Diabolus, you know. He ate yeah. his children all but three. It's like it's like right. it's so great. I was gonna say, you know, I heard that William Peter Blatty didn't actually think The Exorcist was scary because he said, well, you know, if there are demon, if there's a devil, then there's God, and that's really comforting. So this whole story is just kind of a comforting story for you. No, absolutely, and and that is the failing of The Exorcist. Ultimately, to me, is the the last five minutes of the movie, and it's part of the reason why I wrote my book. Um, you know, because after you know Father Karras, you know, takes the tumble down the stairs, and all the stuff has happened. The last five minutes of the movie, it's bright sunlight. Reagan's happy and healthy, and doesn't remember a thing, and everyone smiles. Um, you know, and everything has been like restored. I mean, you know, to fit sort of Blatty's you know religious worldview, and as a as a horror fan. Uh, you know, that, that's where it failed to me because, you know, the best, for me, the best works of horror, you know, after sort of the reveal of the ugly truth or the affect or the big scare, to me, the interesting part is what are these characters going to do now? How have they been fundamentally changed? Because Reagan and her mother and, you know, the other priests would be fundamentally changed by what they just saw. Um, and so my book, in a lot of ways, is a big reaction to those last, what I call, failed five minutes of Blatty's book and The Exorcist, the movie. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, did you ever see Exorcist 3? Uh, I did, yes. Yeah, which I I love. I mean, I think it's amazing. But Blatty directed it, and he's sort of based it all on what he feels like is the failings of the final five minutes of The Exorcist. Because he, yeah. you know, he originally had that scene in the screenplay that he wrote where the cop, uh, Kinderman, and um, Dyer, the other priest... Um, sort of are like, hey, you know, the world's not all bad. Let's go see a movie right. together. And he really felt like you had to restore this. And Blatty, I mean, sorry, Friedkin wanted to end it on a darker, more ominous note. 
Um, which, yeah, it's so like three, I think is fascinating because it does sort of deal all with like the emotional fallout of that movie in a way that like freed can kind of walked away from. I'll have to rewatch it. Cause to be honest, I saw it once and I was probably in my early twenties and you know, I thought it was, was decent. A couple of good scary scenes, but yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't catch sort of the deeper parts of that. Rewatch it. It's really interesting. I mean, it's not a perfect movie. It's got a lot of problems, but there's it's it's really interesting because it's like, in a way, it's what you're saying. It's like another work that's based on a reaction to the end of The Exorcist and how unsatisfying that is. Right. Well, it's funny, you know, because when I, I asked before we did this panel, I asked Grady and Jordan what possession movies I should check out, and you guys kind of said, "Well, there aren't a ton of great ones, right?" I mean, like Jordan, yeah. do you want to do you want to talk about that, like? Why do you think that there's so few home runs when it comes to these sort of possession movies? I think part of it is the inevitable comparison to The Exorcist that no one really wants to deal with. Um, and it's hard to do something completely new. Um, a, a lot of these stories are young women who are being, you know, subjected to these exorcisms because they are experiencing something different in some way, you know, with the exorcist, uh, she gets her period and then she becomes possessed. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of just tropes that are so strong that it's hard for people to overcome them and overcome the comparisons. Um, and it's hard to really break out and do something different. And so I think that that's why a lot of the stuff that we see nowadays um, is more commentary, uh, which I think both, uh, having read both Grady's exorcism book and Paul's exorcism book, I can kind of say that that's how I view both of their books, is that they're taking the exorcism idea and putting it in a, you know, metatextual critical light while writing things that are scary and dark. Did you see The Last Exorcism, Jordan? No, um, I don't let myself see exorcism movies or possession <laughs> movies anymore. <laughs> Paul's laughing at me, but it's true. <laughs> oh, because because that movie it did. I thought some interesting things with what you're talking about with young women. And yeah, I think it's a good film. Yeah, I definitely appreciate its existence, and when it it was one of I I do go through phases where I might allow myself to see something, um, but. Uh, paranormal activity did a number on my brain and <laughs> uh so i don't put myself in situations where i'll be overly spooked by possession narratives anymore i can handle it just fine in fiction um but i don't like seeing it on screen and so i remove myself from the situation i was going to mention for the last exorcism i don't know if we want i i really enjoyed the movie until the last five minutes i mean in yep. some sense i can intellectually sort of appreciate that they sort of went for it. <laughs> but I just thought it just fell totally flat with the sort of the tone of the, the rest of the movie. To me, that was like one of those twists that doesn't work. Like a, a good twist has to sort of recontextualize everything that you saw in a believable way. And it, that didn't work for me uh, in The Last Exorcism. Well, for for me, I mean, I, I, I was really into the movie and there was kind of like two twists at the end. Yeah. Right. And the first of those twists t totally just obliterated my suspension of disbelief. Yes. And so like going into the second twist, I, I they had already lost me. And I think the second I would have been all right with the second twist if it had been built up to better. Um, but uh, it's hard to talk about without spoilers. But are we allowed to? I mean, it's like a six year old movie now, isn't yeah. it? All right. Well, all right. Spo spoiler warning. All right. Go ahead. So the, what was the first twist for you when where, where when they where it supposedly turns out that she was faking the whole time? And she was just ashamed of having had sex and was just pretending to be a demon because she couldn't deal with her religious dad. And then for you, the second twist was when they found out that from the guy that, like, she never even, like, knew him. The guy she said she had sex with, right? Or are you talking about the second twist? The second the twist is the satanic cult. Okay, okay, got yeah. it. Yeah, it's the cult, yeah. My problem with the cult is, you know, and this is, I think, one of the problems with exorcism and possession movies and stuff. And and I had a really hard time with it, like writing a book about it is, is you're dealing with demons and like satanic cults. And it's like, what what the hell does a demon want? Like, what's its motivation? Why is it why is it bothering with some like, you know, 14 year old girl in the middle of nowhere? Why does it give a shit? And it's like, why? I mean, the thing with the last exorcism that killed me in those last five minutes 
why the hell is there a satanic cult in the middle of nowhere? What does it promise them? Like better reception on their satellite TV? Like, Mwah! you know, kill babies for me and you will get new four wall radial tires. <laughs> like, like what do these people have that's so great? Or not great that they yeah. need to. Right. But like, like if those people were in a satanic cult and it had been like, Bill Gates and, you know, like, like, you know, Steven Spielberg and, you know, Mark Wahlberg, I mean, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, fine. I get it. They're rich and they're powerful and their IPOs did well because they worship Satan. But what the hell? Like, these people don't even have houses that are that great. There's your next novel. Mark Wahlberg worships Satan. (laughs) Um, because it's also like i think one of the things that's that movie makers run into is the thing that the exorcist had in spades which is the issue of belief blatty wanted this movie and it was really driven by his engine that he believed this stuff and i gotta tell you i don't think people making last exorcism or emily rose or any of this stuff they don't believe this stuff or not they just want to make a scary hit movie and i think it winds up having like a, as much as I like Last Exorcism, it has a hollowness at it. And it's funny, like, they suddenly throw in this satanic cult. It's what? What, what does that have to do with a possession or a demon or anything? Actually, great. I want to pick up on what you were saying, though, about what is the demon's motivation? Because that was something that really hit me watching um, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Because everyone who comes in contact with this has their faith in God strengthened. Right. So it seems like the demon is being completely counterproductive. Um, you know, it seems like the demons ought to be possessing people and then either telling them that God isn't real or telling them that God is evil or, like, you know, be trying to be portray themselves as sympathetic or something. But right. if you just possess people and act all cr- crazy and spooky and evil, like, even like I would like, you know, I'm like the most hardcore atheist there is. But if that happened to me, I would be like, OK, Jesus, here I come, you know, <laughs> so, like, like, what is the point of these demons? What well, doing? you know. Okay, so so I really, I mean, lots of people get exorcisms in, in real life and in deliverances and all that stuff, which is like the Protestant version. And and I'm all for that. You, you know, you go, girl. But um, to talk about them in like fiction and stuff, I mean, they're, they're a metaphor. And they're a metaphor in the Bible. I mean, there is not a single exorcism or possession in the Old Testament. They're only in the New Testament. Because the point of the story in the Bible is Jesus beats the demon. That that this is supposed to solidify your faith in Christ. Um, and it, so it's, it's, um, it's, th- that's the whole point of it. You're right. You're supposed to see the team and go, I'm out of here. You know, I, where's heaven? Um, and it's interesting because, uh, there, there's a there's a thing that I, I can't remember where I where read it, but it was a guy who who studies exorcisms and he was speaking to someone who does them. And, and they said, you know, science and, and expertise and professionalism have no place in an exorcism. The exorcist has to enter this this arena, this battlefield with the evil armed with nothing but love in at love of Christ and faith. I mean, this is where you test your faith, because in a in a in a in in Christian theology, the second you say Jesus Christ banishes you, get out. No demon can resist the power of God. They're gone, Ooh, done. But the reason they go, I mean, this is my read on it. But the reason they go on and on and on, and the reason I think uh, you know believers believe they go on, on is it is a place to test your faith. This is where you go to see if you really believe in God or not. Um, and and so it's, it's yeah, you're right. They've, yeah. they've kind of got it the wrong way around. And I would say that's a big part of the failing of these movies, because a lot of these movies that we've talked about that aren't you know, as successful, you know, if we're going to say The Exorcist was successful, is these movies, I think, take a really sort of lazy approach, like a lazy appeal toward uh, faith. It's sort of like they take for granted that people, you know, that most people believe in Christianity at least, you know, in the United States, that most people watching these movies are just going to take for granted, oh, yeah, there's demons, you know, sort of, they, they come after us. That's what they do. Yeah. Um, and that's why these movies fail, because I do think, you know, they're relying on that sort of lazy appeal to, or easy appeal to faith. Yeah, I agree. They don't, they don't make the case for faith. They make the right. case for the devil, but they don't make sure. the case for faith. So there's, um, a weird, uh, there's a movie called Kill List by Ben Wheatley. I don't know. If yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not a possession film, but in terms of like having like this weird cult at the end, and to me, it, it totally works because there is no real explanation to it, and there's no, uh, I don't know, there's none of that lazy sort of appeal to faith. This is just a messed up crew of people 
that that are sort of hinted at, you know, throughout the movie. You know, there's no really reason. There's no rhyme to it. And, you know, obviously sometimes it doesn't work, but just the way sort of Wheatley sets it up. Uh, I mean, I totally bought it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting because there's two ways people look at the popularity because let's face it, not a lot of people were talking about exorcisms before the exorcist. I mean, they existed, they've existed for hundreds of years. And so there's two interesting things that I've read that talk about why this huge resurgence of interest in exorcisms um, after the exorcist came out. And one is it's the exorcist, you know, you had all these other movies piggybacking off the, all these books, Malachi Martin, the priest, you know, writing his like hostage of the devil and all his nonfiction stuff. They were all bestsellers about Americans like you and me having exorcisms because Satan's everywhere. But there's another thought that is with Vatican II um, and, and, and sort of the Catholic Church modernizing and, you know, the, the priest can now face uh, the congregation, you know, and not turn his back and they can do it in English instead of Latin and all this stuff, that the church moved away from this idea that pain and suffering were evil. That there used to be this idea that pain was evil and you defeated pain, you defeated suffering. And in this sort of new, more therapy, uh, uh, you know, this, this Catholicism or this version of Christianity that em- embraced therapeutic language, pain and suffering were now things you endured. They, they taught you things. They had enduring them had positive, like redemptive value, like, oh, that's terrible, but everything happens for a reason. And, you know, God has a plan and we'll learn from this and all this. And then exorcism was, was this, you know, thing that went back to, no, this is evil. Pain is evil. Suffering is evil. And this is healing. The exorcism is where healing happens. Like what happened to just healing yourself of this stuff and getting rid of it, which I don't think is a hundred percent, you know, why that happened, but I think it's probably a factor. Could I ask you, Grady, like you mentioned, I mean, like people in China say if they get uh, possessed by a demon or like in the Old Testament times, do they have any remedy? Like if, if there's no if they don't know of Jesus or if Jesus hasn't come around yet, do they have any remedy for a demon? Like, is there anything else you can do to exercise one? Well, in the Old Testament, there are a few exorcisms, or not really exorcisms, but demons are cast out, but they're cast out by angels or by God directly. New Testament is the first time that a human working like with the, the power of God can actually do this. And they, and it becomes more of an exorcism situation rather than God's just intervening because this is a bad scene. Um, and you know, all over the world, like possession is, is everywhere. I mean, you know, uh, you see it in, in China, you see it everywhere, even outside Christian theology. And there it's regarded as sort of almost a shamanistic kind of thing. There's no, you invite this, this spirit in to, to give you knowledge. I mean, uh, to, to reveal things, to put you in an ecstatic state where you, uh, speak with its wisdom and stuff. Um, and so in that case, you know, the demon or the spirit just goes away when the ritual's over. Um, but there are, you know, I mean, one of the big hits of last year for in Korea was a movie called The Priest, which is a straight up old school Catholic exorcism movie because, you know, 10 percent of the population of Korea are Catholic. Um, the Philippines has exorcism movies, which because it's a Catholic country that follow the, the standard format. Um, there's a great one called Sapi um, from a couple of years ago. This phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it either follows the Catholic model or it's a more shamanistic, less Christian based model where the, you know, the spirit leaves when it gets bored. Yeah. I mean, so Jordan, you mentioned that you don't watch uh, possession movies so much anymore, but you read possession books. Are there any possession literary works that you want to mention? Um, yeah. So Grady and Paul's books are the ones that I've been preaching about for a while now. Um, there's not you know, I'm primarily a YA editor and there's not a ton of it in YA. Um, it kind of got a stigma of you can't sell it. Um, but there is a novel by Gretchen McNeil called Possess that follows a teen exorcist, um, on her, uh, she gets connected with a priest and then performs exorcisms with him and there's demons and it's, it's really great. It was Gretchen's first novel. Um, but you know, for me, I think I, it sounds pandering because they're here, but <laughs> Paul and Grady's books are the ones that, um, it really 
enjoyed and keep thinking about. Um, I can't see Paul in person and not go up to him and say, remember that horrifying thing that you had a character do in the exorcism scene of your book? Um, because it stuck with me. Um, and the same thing with Grady is they're both looking at this well-known trope and then playing with it and trying to explore what is actually happening. Um, and I think that that's really cool. So yeah, I recommend their book. Well, well, so Paul, yeah. So why don't you say a bit more about your book? Because you mentioned that it involves exorcism. And I mentioned in the intro, it also involves reality television. Could you talk about why you decided to combine those two things? Well, it's funny. I mean, to, to go back to a little bit what Jordan was talking about, uh, part of the reason why I, I sort of had like eureka moment for the book was I, I happened to be thinking about sort of the horror market. I was reading, I was actually reading essays about uh, the exorcist, which I mentioned earlier. And it sort of occurred to me, that cheese, you know, no one, um, you know, there's tons of zombie novels out there, you know, even by sort of quote unquote high literary authors. There's been literary updates of the werewolf recently and, you know, the vampire never seems to go away. But I had a really hard time thinking of someone really doing an update of The Exorcist or even like possession novel for at least since Sarah Grand's, which was 2003. So I started thinking, you know, how would I write an exorcism novel? And the place I wanted to start from were, were two places. Was one, I, would, I wanted to write a secular or skeptical exorcist novel, um, one that wouldn't shy away from the exorcist and sort of take it, you know, the movie and the original novel and sort of, you know, head on, sort of react to it. Um, and to do that, I, I sort of came upon the, the two sisters of the story. Mary is the younger sister. She's eight years old when her older sister, Marjorie, is either, you know, schizophrenic or or maybe she's possessed or maybe she's faking. I mean, there's, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, and I wanted to... And it was going to be from Mary's point of view. I sort of knew this right away. So I wanted to put as many different filters on her narrative as I could just to try to really build the ambiguity. You know, besides the fact that Mary is recounting most of the novel 15 years after this has happened. So memory is an imperfect, you know, mental device. Um, and uh, so I also decided to have the reality show sort of come in to sort of muddy up what's real and what's not, what's staged, what isn't staged. And even the fact that Mary could years later watch these six episodes of reality TV, and that would totally, you know, mess with her memories of what happened. So, I mean, so did you finish this book? And you're like, oh yeah, this is going to scare the hell out of Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> no, whenever I write anything, because not everything I've done is horror, but when I do write something that, you know, I, I think is sort of dark or disturbing, I'm always like, man, I don't know if this is scary. Uh, but the moment I knew it was scary is when I sent it to my agent and he had sent it out and he got like really strong reactions right away. He, he called me up to tell me that a random editor, one he barely knew, called him up at 1130 at night. Didn't say hi, didn't say anything. She just said, I just read the tongue scene and I just had to hear someone else's voice. <laughs> <laughs> and then she hung up on him. And I was like, yes, I guess it is scary. <laughs> uh, but no, the, the day, August 18th, 2015, that Stephen King tweeted out, that my book scared him was an amazing day for sure. <laughs> Have there been any other memorable reactions to the book like that? Uh, my wife cried because she thinks that Mary is our daughter. Oh. You know, I, I, I took a lot of stuff from my daughter for Mary, but Mary is not my daughter. No, people have been very nice. It's been you know a very fun year with people's reaction to it. I love hearing people sort of vehemently argue that nothing supernatural happened. And I have plenty of other people on the other side who vehemently argue that no, Marjorie was possessed. And there's a subset of people say, no, it was actually Mary who was possessed the whole time. So I, I've really enjoyed that part of it because I purposefully tried to build build it so the reader could build their own case on either side, a compelling case on either side, that either something supernatural happened or something didn't happen. Huh. And I saw that now there's a real exorcism reality TV show that's, that came out. Yeah, it was like a one-day thing uh, to go back to the exorcist that uh, it was like Destination America, you know, sort of a cable channel that you can only get <laughs> uh, if you buy like the most expensive cable, the most expensive cable package, I think. But uh, they did like a, a live exorcism of the supposed exorcism house uh, that the Blatty, the, the case that Blatty uh, referenced in his movie. They went to the house and supposedly exercised the house. I did not watch it, though. I heard it was awful, which was not surprising. <laughs> How is, is exorcism, is that still something that happened? Like, how common is that today, like exorcisms? Oh, Grady can probably talk about it. But in my, my, in my research, I was just sort of surprised to see that it seems to be on the increase. Um, I know, you know, so I wrote the book in 2013. 
you know, when I was doing research at the time, there was uh, Spanish bishops and cardinals, you know, petitioning, uh, you know, petitioning the Vatican to ask for more priests to be ordained as, uh, as exorcists because the demand has been increasing. So I was, uh, you know, in a way it sort of makes sense to me because I don't know, maybe for a lot of people, it seems like we live in a scarier time. And so people turn to, you know, what they believe in and, you know, the idea of being able to take away pain and suffering through an exorcism would certainly bring comfort to, um, you know, a lot of Catholics who are afraid. Yeah. But I mean, one issue that comes up in the exorcism of M Emily Rose is that sometimes these exorcisms end up killing innocent people, right? Yeah, I mean, I, in my research, I never, I don't know, I didn't find, I didn't delve too deeply, so I didn't find any cases where someone had actually died through the process. I don't know if Brady had found any cases in, that, in which that happened. Yeah, I mean, there are. I mean, there was... Um... God, I think in the 90s, Charity Miranda died out of I mean, there, these cases come up. There's one in Ontario right now where a Mountie um, kept his kid chained up in the basement. And, like, his brother was a priest. And they, like, starved the kid. The kid, when he escaped, weighed, was, like, 14 years old and weighed 50 five pounds or something yeah. insane but and they did all, and they were like oh he's possessed you know we do all this exorcism it went on for years but i often think that a lot of these times when like you have because there are a, a good significant portion of really upsetting cases where kids are killed in exorcisms sure. um i actually think those are child abuse situations where the exorcism part is just a thin band-aid on it afterwards Cases like the Annalise Michelle case, where it's an actual official exorcism, where the person is participating and they die, and they're and I think she was nineteen or twenty when it happened. They're an adult. They happen, but they're very rare. Um, it's a bummer. I mean, I don't know, because Paul's right. Exorcism, I think, and deliverance, which is sort of I think the Protestant version, like they are on the the rise, and I actually think they're not entirely bad like um you know it's it's you've got a person who has a pro like so uh, you know hauntings and ghosts in movies and books and and maybe reality but mostly in movies and books that's someone else's problem right you move into a house where some murders happened and you're stuck with the like aftermath of this terrible thing demons are your problem i mean we even call them that right like you've got your own personal demons um and I actually think that if the, the, the lens that someone's looking at whatever problem this is they're having is a demon and you meet someone who's also looking at it that way, who's an exorcist or a minister or whatever, it gives people that, I mean, there is a real therapeutic exchange well, that's, there. That's what the guy, the fake exorcist in The Last Exorcism, that's, yeah. that's exactly what he says, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's a guy, I don't know, you might have read this, uh, Paul, uh, Michael Canillo's American Exorcism. I know of it, but I didn't read it. Yeah. I mean, he's a sociologist who sort of went out in the field. Uh, I think he teaches at the New School or for, no, Fordham. And um, he's like, you know, he went out and studied real exorcisms in America and deliverances. And it's a really great history of them. And he's like, I mean, look, you know, I've witnessed a lot of these things. And I've witnessed a lot of people, you know, saying that this really helped them over whatever they were going through at the time. Um and he's like, look, I'm not, a, I'm not doing a medical study here. I didn't do a lot of follow up, but like, I, 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 to me, it's just, it's kind of another form of therapy with a religious guise over it. I mean, you know, what's a lot of medicine, but a, a ritualized placebo. Right. I mean, I, in my, I mean, well, I started because I did try to put like, is there a supernatural element going? Most of my research sort of dealt around with sort of, I don't know, to me, as uh, like I would sort of describe myself as David described himself earlier, someone who puts a lot more stock into you know science and, and whatnot. Although I am clearly not a psychologist, but particularly in the case of children, um, it just seems to me all the cases that I read about were the, you know these poor kids who had no choice in the matter. Oh yeah, or yeah. Have, you know, were obviously, were having their mental illness symptoms being conflated with with proof of you know they're having a demon you know inside of them, and even for adults. I would I would be interested to see like a follow up. I mean, I have a hard time believing that there isn't some underlying sort of medical or mental condition that you know maybe the exorcism serves as like a salve or a bomb for a year or two, but then you know what happens five ten years down the line. Yeah, well, no, and I look, I agree with you. I yeah. think with children especially, I mean, it's not often even their mental illness. It's often, I believe, the mental illness of their parents. No, absolutely. Um, 
you know, being projected onto the kids. But, you know, it's really fascinating to read these accounts of like deliverance ministry and stuff where it's like 15 or 20 people in a room, you know, and, and they're, they're having their demons cast out and they're all there to work on specific demons. You know, the demon of pornography addiction, the demon of alcoholism, the demon of, um, you know, blasphemous thoughts or whatever it is. Right. And like, you know, they puke and they scream and they holler. I mean, you can see these things. You can, there's some on YouTube. And, you know, it's like, yeah, maybe they have another one in six to eight months, but it's, the language is so much like AA, you know? It's like, you have a problem, but it's not you. There's something inside of you that's doing this to you. It's a disease. It's a demon. And you have no control over it. But we can help you and we will give you this structure, whether it's the 12 steps or whether it's, you know, a, a ritual to expel the demon. And at the end of that, you will no longer have this inside of you and you still have work to do, Sure. but you're free of this thing. That's I mean, a, it's, I'll say that's a very seductive message, too, to hear if you're someone yeah. who's sort of suffering is, oh, it's not my fault. You know, it's, yeah. it, it you know, relieves you of responsibility for potentially having to do difficult life changes and uh yeah put it in the hands of something or someone else see paul can you explain to me why is your book called head full of ghosts rather than head full of demons or head full of satan <laughs> uh well because it, it sounds badass <laughs> yeah well honestly uh i'm a big music nerd and i get a ton of inspiration for music and bad religion had just come out with true north um like a month before i sort of had the idea for the book and on that album, there was a song called My Head is Full of Ghosts. And once I sort of, and the, the lyrics mentioned, you know, something about sort of possession and metacognition and stuff like that. So to me, that became like the soundtrack of my book. So I originally, I started the whole book with the title first. It was originally My Head is Full of Ghosts, and then we just tweaked it. Um, it was very cool to get permission from the band to, to use it, quote them from the epigraph. So I have actually had that comment a couple times. There's no ghosts in here. How come? Uh... <laughs> Like it's metaphorical. <laughs> Can I just say that I was writing my best friend's exorcism when I heard about Head Full of Ghosts, and I was so pissed off. <laughs> I was like, God damn it. Yeah. It's like another exorcism book, and it's got a badass title. <laughs> like, there is no way. I was so angry. And I didn't even read your book until I was completely done with the drafts of mine, because I didn't want to accidentally, like, you know, rip you off or anything. Oh, yeah, no, um, I the same thing. No, and I loved it, and I was so happy to see that, like what you do is so radically different from what I was doing. And like, but like, there's so much fodder here that it can support so many different takes. Well, Grady, why don't you tell us about My Best Friend's Exorcism? What, is, what was your take on this idea? Well, it was originally like Paul. It was actually a title before it was anything. Like I was just like screwing around one day and I was like, My Best Friend's Exorcism. Ha <laughs> And I was like, God, that's, Hmm. And so, and then like Paul also, I was like, well, there's not a lot out there. There's Sarah Grant. There's, there's very little else. There was a book by a woman named, is it Danielle Vega called The Merciless? That's a YA book a couple of years ago. Yeah. The, the YA series that Razorville publishes with the hot pink cover. With the hot pink, which is a good cover, I thought. Yeah. Um, and there was that, but there really wasn't a whole lot else. And, and I was thinking about it, but I was like, you know, the big problem with, to me is that exorcism books and movies and mostly movies they all devolve to there's a girl tied to a bed and an old man standing over her screaming at her and like i was like that's such a bummer like that dynamic is just so screwed up and um i wanted to know if there was a way around it and so i was like well it's my best friend's exorcism and it was like oh well that's you know friendship's obviously the strongest in high school and i was like well i'll write about my time in high school and that was the 80s and and sort of things just sort of like i haven't written a lot of novels so to me the process is still kind of fascinating the way that once you start really focusing on your book things just seem to snap into place in a really almost eerie way like like it's like the world helps you like Oh, well, I'll set it in 88 because that's when I'm in 10th grade. Well, 10th grade was rough for me. Later, I talked to a bunch of teachers doing research and they're all like, oh, Jesus Christ, 10th grade. It's like where kids go crazy. Um, and it's like also 88 was the year of Geraldo's exposing Satan's underground, that whole satanic panic thing in America where we thought heavy metal albums had like backward mass, you know, messages mm -hmm. from the hell that was erupting. And. And then I was doing all this research on exorcism and that quote about like, you know, how this isn't a place for experts, it's for amateurs. And it's all about like, you know, you have to enter the arena of diabolical battle armed with nothing but love and faith. And I was like, well, 
in a largely like secular world, where's that love and faith? It's not going to be with Jesus so much anymore. And I was like, shit, it's with your friends. And that's in high school. That was really what I had faith in is that, you know, these people I knew who now I know they were just as screwed up as I was. But at the time I was like, these are the awesome people who are going to save me from myself um, and everyone around me and the whole world and all these adults who are so horrible. Um, and so I, and I really sort of sort of focused in on that and wanted to write something that sort of like, uh, deconstructed that model of exorcisms are all about young girls at the mercy of old men. Yeah, is it, is it true, Grady, that your wife read the first draft and was like, ah, oh, this sucks, and you had to start <laughs> over from the beginning? Man, you know, I joke about it. That was such a rough day. So I had written, like, I wrote, like, I wrote about 60,000 words of the first draft, and, like, I was like, this rocks. Oh, my God, I'm like a writer. Ah! And, um... I gave it to my wife. I was so proud of it. And like, I so wanted to see that look in her eyes where she puts it down. She's like, Oh my God, you're amazing. <laughs> and we were, uh, and, and she put it down and she's like, Oh, well, we'll talk about it. We had to go to a friend's party and we we're on the subway. So I'm glad she chose a, 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 a private place to tell me this. <laughs> and she's like, this is really bad. She's like, this is pretty terrible. This is basically just a bunch of cliches and it's very shallow and it's, it's awful. And I, Man, like, th th people say, like, hell is a woman scorned. No, wounded male vanity is, like, one of the most toxic forces. Like, I exploded. It was awful. Like, I got off at one station. I don't want to be on this train with you. I had to get back on the next station. You know, it was really stupid. Um, but she was right. Like, I was honestly just recycling tropes of high school movies and high school books and John Hughes movies and, and all this just crap that was stuck in my head. And so... She did me this huge favor. She gave me all of her letters and all of her photos and diaries from high school. And I sort of hauled out all mine that I've been carrying around for God knows what reasons. And I really just sat there and started reading them all. And it, it was about two or three weeks. And um, I would like copy over letters that I'd written in high school, just rewrite them um, just to get into that mindset again. And it was after about two weeks or so, like, I had an actual memory of what it actually felt like to be in high school in 1988. And then another one came and another one, and they all just sort of came out. And like, I was finally felt like I was actually writing something real that didn't exist before, rather than just taking someone else's toys and like, you know, gluing GI Joe butt onto star Wars <laughs> arms, you know? Uh, but yeah, she did me a huge favor, but it was, it was ugly, man. <laughs> Well, and you've been handing out these stickers all over New York where it's like a pink inverted pentagram with a unicorn in it. What's the story oh, behind that? Well, because, you know, we had an original cover design is so crazy with books and like um, and and so I really like Quirk, even though they're small, because they they let me be involved with the design process a little bit. And so. The original designs we were they were they were bring, coming back with were, were good designs, but they were very like book designs. Um, they felt very bookish, and um, and then the designer just started going bonkers because the editor and I, my editor, and I just kept saying we want more, we want more. So he started doing these crazy Lisa Frank things, you know, with the puppies and the kittens and all this. And then he started doing, and we finally went up to design. We like we left the Lisa Frank stuff behind because we didn't want to be sued, and you know she's a little bonkers and her style so distinctive, but. They were going to do like um, stickers, and we that's when we brought that back, you know, that whole Lisa Frank rainbow unicorns and puppies and pentagrams, because everyone remembers Lisa Frank from high school. Hmm. Well, see, so it's Jordan, you said that you read My Best Friend's Exorcism. Is there anything you want to add about the book? It's, I mean, it's, it feels like high school, and I think that that's a testament to Grady doing the research. Um, I'm, I'm good friends with Grady. I have spent time in his office and the research that Grady does is so extensive and literally covers the walls of his office. And there were high school yearbooks and um, photos of teenagers and not in a creepy way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like it and bits of their hair yeah. <laughs> um but it was you can you can feel the 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 honesty and truth of it just because like grady has put forth so much 
effort into the research. Um, and I think that, uh, a big thing for me as a horror reader and editor is being able to do that slow burn that I think is essential to a good horror story, whether it's film or books. Um, and I've had long talks with Grady about like, when do you, uh, when do you go there with the, the abject horror and the vomit and the poop and the blood and, and all of that. And I think that it's something, you know, I had talked to Grady about that and then I read Paul's book and then I had a phone call with Paul's agent about Paul's book just because he knew I liked exorcism books. And I was sitting in an office surrounded by people talking about like, and you know, the choice of like when to use the vomit was really on point. <laughs> and, and I think that it's just, both of these guys are able to know when to go there. And I think a lot of people, when they approach these kinds of stories, go immediately to, okay, well, it's head spinning and pea soup and just disgusting, you know, abject horror. And really so much of it is, so much of the darkness is happening before you ever get to the physical depictions of the horror. Um, and so that's what works for me in both of their books. And I think is what I look for whenever I'm looking at these kinds of demonic possession pieces is what do you do before you have your character puke? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I would say like, just to build on that really quickly, uh, in, in my book, what I really tried to do is, you know, I certainly had sort of the, the puke and sort of the stereotypical stuff that you see in exorcism movies, but those scenes I tried to to really make the most ambiguous as oh is something is that real or is it not real? I even have a blogger in the novel who sort of acts almost like as a Greek chorus is commenting on the action so that, you know and says, "Hey, this looks like the Exorcist or hey, this looks like paranormal activity so hopefully the reader is like, "Oh, so is that was that stage is that real and to me the the exciting part about writing the book because usually when I write a novel, I have like a scene or two in my head that act as the carrot at the end of the, the stick for me. Like, okay, I'm going to write this book because I want to get to this scene. Those are sort of my rewards. Um, and in A Head Full of Ghosts, to me, the two most horrific, you know, disturbing scenes are the ones that are the least supernaturally tinged, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and that was really important to me, you know, for the idea of the book. Well, I got to say, like, with, with Head Full of Ghosts, and I don't mean this to turn into, like, a, a human centipede of group ass kissing, but, um, no, the stuff I liked most in there was the stuff between the two sisters. Like, the older I'm sorry, I'm terrible with the names of characters, but when the older sister is so just willfully cruel to her little sister, and when her little sister just keeps re-exposing herself to that cruelty, to me, that was the stuff that worked so well, because, I got to say, I am so, like, you read a lot of books when you write books and you so often read stuff that doesn't felt like feel like someone's felt experience that it feels like, Oh, this is this scene and this is what's supposed to happen here and all this. And that stuff felt real. That stuff felt like observed and felt, and it just felt so different from so many other books. I, it, that's the stuff I loved in your book. I mean, the puking's all great and everything, but the, <laughs> the cruelty between the two sisters, like that's the stuff that really made my skin crawl. And everything well, with the Richard Scary book. I I remember yeah, I, I yeah. sent Paul an, a Facebook message, I think, that was like, you managed to make Richard Scary scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, Paul. I, I heard you mention in an interview a, a possession story called Mother of Stone by John Langan. Yeah. I was just curious if you wanted to talk about that or any other literary possession stories that you can think of. Sure. So, I mean, John's, it's a novella and it appears in his collection, The Wide Carnivorous Sky. And uh, John's one of my best friends, but he's also one of my favorite writers. And it's sort of a, a weird novella to, to sort of describe. It's told in second person. Um, and there's this uh, sort of strange statue and, and sort of like awful things start happening to people within its proximity. And, you know, and it sort of goes into like a weird possession area, uh, area story wise. And it's just unlike any sort of possession or exorcism piece of fiction that I've read, at least in, in a long time. Um, otherwise, you know, a few, it's funny, in my head, I almost sort of separate exorcist stories from possession stories, because there's a lot of stories, as, you know, as Grady mentioned, particularly sort of in Asian cinema, where there's, you know, a spirit sort of overtakes you, it's not necessarily a demon. 
Um, but to me, they sort of fit in the same ballpark. Uh, Session Nine from 2001 is one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, partly because I grew up like 10 miles from <laughs> Danvers State Mental Hospital, where, where the where the movie was filmed. And that was the big joke when we were growing up. Where are you going to college? Oh, I'm going to Danvers State. Um, <laughs> and it's sort of, a, it's a weird, subtle, you're not sure what's happening. You know, maybe it, it, someone is actually possessed by an evil entity or maybe not. Um, and I think maybe the one that most people probably haven't heard about is one of my favorites. It's called The Cormorant by Stephen Gregory. Um, Oh, I've never read it. Yeah, the novel was written in 1986. Oh, it's just such a weird, messed up book. Um, you know, it begins with this English school teacher who leaves some, you know, urban environment in, in England to go write and live with his family in this quaint cottage in Wales that he just inherited from his uncle. Uh, but the, the kicker is he gets to keep the cottage as long as he takes care of his uncle's pet cormorant, which is sort of this big, ugly black bird. Very strange. And uh, it, it's sort of hard to describe, but it's just so bizarre. And, you know, the possession part of it is, um, you know, maybe that the, the uncle's spirit sort of is within the bird and eventually sort of overtakes maybe his son or, or, or even himself. And it's just a really bizarre, unsettling book. So I highly recommend chasing that one down. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that because, I mean, like in the Bible, there's the story of the Gerasene demoniac where Jesus takes the demons out of the man and puts them in the pigs. So I was just wondering if possessed animals feature prominently in horror stories the oh, witch i didn't i didn't know that story yeah <laughs> that goat I, I just thought i just thought the goat was evil i didn't know it was possessed i thought the whole thesis of the movie was goats are bad news <laughs> <laughs> they are bad news i i was just telling a, a brief story last night that no one cares about but i was at a petting zoo three years ago with my daughter and it was all baby goats and one giant goat so first like why they put the giant coat in the, in the petting zoo because the giant goat was preventing the kids from getting the feed. Every time a kid tried to put a quarter in to get feed, the giant goat would just come over and eat the food. <laughs> so I came over like that. I'm an adult here. I'll take care of this. So I sort of boxed out the big goat like, a, you know, I was playing basketball, going for a rebound or something to let a kid, uh, you know, put the put the money in. And the goat just totally rammed me in the back of the leg. It was horrible. It was, his name was Black Phillip, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Def definitely. It sounds like a demon name. <laughs> I the witch is is one of the first movies I allowed myself to see in theaters because I assumed I would be able to get through it without being overly freaked out. Um, but what I found interesting about the witch is that they show you the witch like 20 minutes in. So there's no yeah. ambiguity as to is this girl crazy? Um, and I, I don't know how I, I still don't know how I feel about it because I think that if we had never seen the witch, it would have been a completely different narrative. And it would have it would have been another crazy, is this girl crazy? Is she possessed? Is she a witch story? But because the creators made the decision to literally show the audience the witch eating a baby, it like <laughs> took away all of the question of what is actually happening to this teenage girl. I was just going to say, you know, it's funny, that whole ambiguity, like what's really going on here thing, it's really something I struggled with with my best friend's exorcism. Like Paul's book, the gas in his tank is what's really going on here. Like, you know, like like that ambiguity, like really drives that book. And I was kind of doing the same thing with my best friend's exorcism. And I had these huge fights with my editor because he'd be like, everyone knows there's an exorcism coming. It's in the fucking <laughs> title. And, and, and he had a good point, which was like, <laughs> I, I could only get so far with that ambiguity because before people would just start tapping their foot and being like, come on, man, we know the exorcism's happening. Where the hell is it? So you should just change the title to My Best Friend's Exorcism or not. Yeah, <laughs> dot, 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 question mark. Question mark, question mark yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny, even The Witch, Jordan, maybe because I sort of expect like ambiguity at this point for a lot of these movies, you know, if yeah. they're not made in Hollywood. Um, I thought the way the the witch was shot like that early scene that we're talking about it felt it felt kind of dreamlike to me at, at a point where i was like geez i wonder if this is like the imaginings of uh you know someone in the family who's imagining what's happened to the kid I, and that was probably my that was probably my own sort of just bringing that to the to the uh to the movie because it was like appalling like wow like they're eating or she's eating a baby <laughs> yeah um 
One thing we haven't talked about because it's not fully possession, but it falls under satanic horror is demon children. Uh. Um, <laughs> you know, and because I, I adore Rosemary's Baby and the Omen, the original Omen, um, and I think that that feels to me like a much more tangible. If I'm the devil, a much more tangible way to get my point point of view across is by inhabiting a child um, or impregnating a woman with my son of Satan. But the problem with that whole plan, because I agree with you, I always think that's such a better idea for Satan. But the problem with it is then you have to grow up. Right? right? Like, I just read this book called, um, it's from the 80s called Such a Good Baby by um, Ruby Jensen, who is this nice old grandma in, like, Arkansas who wrote all these sort of, like, really mass market paperback horror things. And this is about, you know, a girl who gets Satan's baby, and the baby's born, and the baby's evil. But the problem is, it's a baby. It can't really do anything about it. Like, it can't even hold its head up by itself. And so you've got this baby that can barely crawl, murdering all all these people because it's so evil like it is the funniest thing it's like for like a big chunk of the book all it can do is vomit profusely and horribly because that's all babies do and like it is amazing because it's like well yeah think about it like if you are a satan baby that must be so frustrating like you're like <laughs> i want to get like you can't even get an erection until you're like you know years down the road and you're like I want to be at an orgy and a black mass and killing virgins and I'm having to eat like you know strained carrots and like wear a <laughs> diaper and be carried around like this sucks this sounds like a perfect like adult kids book like a pop-up book yeah. a book. Someone, someone needs to make that Satan's baby Great. Oh, totally. Great. Like, That's like, me and you. Our next. Episode. Oh, totally. It's just like Satan did not think this plan through. You know, here he is as a baby. God damn it! Well, are those, the, are those books like Satan's first birthday or something like that? Is what? No, because no, because there's like those books, Baby's First Birthday, right? So this would be oh, like yeah, Satan's right. first birthday. Yep. Oh, I'm totally stealing that title. That's great. <laughs> um. Well, I okay, but uh, Damien is a TV show that's on right now that looks at Damien from the Omen as a 30 year old man. Um, so much like Jesus became the Jesus we all know it when he turned 30 and uh, Damien in the TV show is starting to realize who he is. Um, and it's an interesting look at the character because at the end of the Omen, he's just a creepy kid who's about to live in the White House, and you're like, oh no, he's going to wreak havoc as a child. Um, but so the TV show posits that he's just this guy who has been followed by darkness his whole life until he, you know, turns 30 and realizes that he is supposedly the son of Satan. Um, and it's been an interesting, I haven't finished it, but it's been an interesting show to watch because he's, you know, your typical, like, hot, tortured TV guy. But the question is, does he embrace what his, you know, destiny of being, you know, the uh, person who brings about the apocalypse as the Antichrist? Or does he fight it? Um, and, you know, the show is doing a great job of feeling like an extension of the omen, the original omen, um, in terms of all of the, like, gruesome, crazy death scenes that happen in The Omen and the TV show. Um, but my big question from the pilot was, okay, well, are we going the, you know, traditional TV savior route of he's going to save himself? Or is this really just going to be a show of watching someone accept their fate and totally embrace the darkness, which I think might actually be more interesting um, these days, since we get so many redemption narratives. I mean, I think we're all expecting Kylo Ren to be, uh, to get redemption in Star Wars. And I think that, um, there's something to be said for someone just not looking for redemption. But, but to me, it's such a, like, it's such a, um, terrible thing because it's like he's got a choice, right? He can either be really, really, really great at being like the son of Satan. Or he can kind of be okay at presenting, preventing the apocalypse. Like, who's going to care about the guy who made something not happen? Right. But this this gets back to my question though about demon 
motivations? Because if God is omnipotent, what's even the point of trying to fight him? Like, what are the demons, like, they must know God's omnipotent, right? Like, how, like, it seems like they should just do something, you know, more enjoyable than trying to fight God, because they're, they're not ever going to win. Well, there's an interesting, there's a BB, I don't know, did anyone ever see that BBC miniseries, Ultraviolet, with Idris Elba, about um, the vampires? No. no. Sure. It's really, really fantastic. And it's from a few years ago. And the guy who made that made a recent one that didn't get as much attention because it doesn't have Idris Elba in it um, called uh, Apparitions. And it's about demons from hell possessing people on Earth. And the demon point of view is we just want out of hell. It's really, really, really bad there. And by not letting us come to Earth and possess people, because they're mostly possessing people who've been brain dead in vegetative states and like comas or, or people who are really severely like mentally ill or who cannot, you know, people who are sort of like not leading much of a life. They're like, you are perpetuating a Holocaust against us. We have been doomed to like eternal torture and suffering for no other reason than we're demons. Like it is a complete Holocaust against demons run by heaven and all we're doing we are jews escaping nazi germany and saying please just give us sanctuary here and you want to send us back to to germany to die in the camps it's kind of a fascinating like way of looking at their motivation because you're right otherwise their motivation is pretty thin that does sound cool i'll have to watch it okay so another issue i wanted to bring up is in both um paranormal activity and in the exorcism of emily rose there's like audio tapes or videotapes of these things happening. And it just makes me wonder if exorcisms are a real thing or demonic possessions are a real thing that happens. How come there's not videos all over YouTube of people like, oh, here's my cousin. He's possessed by a demon. And like, he's like, you know, like the cousin definitely seems like he's possessed by a demon. Well, there are. I mean, there are videos all over YouTube and, and other places of, of people getting deliverances or exorcisms and stuff. Sure. And I know I tried to play with that with my book, you know, just having the reality TV crew. And there's even a part where Mary, the younger sister, is given a, a camera for, her, you know, for herself to use. is almost like a little found footage sort of uh, treatment to it. You know, she films her sister and later on they're watching her filming her sister. And like, you know, so instead of making things more clear, you know, having all those cameras and different perspectives, you know, just made everything a little you know, more muddy. But, but I mean, Grady, is there anything, like, where you watch and you're like, oh, like, that looks hard to explain by natural, like, is there anything supernatural no. caught on tape ever? I mean, I haven't seen anything. Um, I see what looks like people in genuine distress, you know, but I, I don't see anything supernatural. But no, like, head spinning around or <laughs> crab walking or anything, like, people on the ceiling, like. No, although it's it's actually interesting. In in that uh, Michael Canio in that book American Exorcism the nonfiction book in the in the sort of conclusion of it he writes about sort of his personal experience because he witnessed something like fifty or sixty exorcisms watching this and um and uh, he says you know I never saw anything that didn't have another better explanation he's like but what was so weird to me is how different what I saw was from the people who were there participating in the deliverance of the exorcism. They would say, well, didn't you see them levitate? We all saw it. Everyone in that room saw them rise up out of that chair by like five or six inches. And he'd be like, I'm sorry. I just I just didn't see it. And I really do think that depending on what lens you're looking at this through, you're seeing something radically different. But presumably if there was a camera, it would not show the person levitating, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I assume so. But like, you know, I guess it's funny. It's one of those things where I think a lot of people who do this and like really believe in this stuff would say that like the principle of of exorcism or, or deliverance at the heart of it is faith, not knowledge. So like if we did catch this on camera, well, what's the big deal? Here you go. There's proof that there's forces of the supernatural in the world. And now unless if you don't believe in God, like you said earlier, Dave, unless you, if you don't believe in God, then you're a dummy, right? Here's proof. We've got it. You know, they're demons, there's a devil, there's evil, there's God. Like, you're an idiot if you don't, like, believe in God. And I think for these guys, what's more compelling is it's faith. They got to take it on faith. They, it has to be an issue of belief. Um, you know, that, that that makes it about them. That doesn't make it the subjective reality where they have to believe, but they make the choice to believe. Right, but so, like, in the exorcism of Emily Rose, she decides, she makes a choice to stay in her tortured body because that's going to provide evidence that demons are real, which is going to help um, convert people to Christianity. 
That's a terrible idea. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, one of the things, too, that's funny is, and I think, I mean, Paul gets into this a little bit in his book, is I feel like, and this is no slam on anyone, but I just feel like it's the way the world is. If someone had a videotape of an exorcism where someone's head spun around or they levitated and they released it unedited to the world, the people who aren't going to believe in it aren't going to believe in it, and the people who are, are. You know what I mean? Like, it's just... Even photographic evidence these days is not a 100% guarantee of anything. I certainly wouldn't believe in it if I saw a head spinning around. I'd say, well, there's some really clever special effects guys at work there. Right. Unless it was David Blaine. I would believe David Blaine is actually levitating. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. What if David Blaine got possessed by a demon? Oh, my God. Man, we're just coming up with idea after idea for a story. This is gold. I just, I just think there's no way to make someone believe something they're not inclined to believe in in the first no, place. No, but, but Grady, if there were like possessions happening all the time and people were constantly catching them on film, that would persuade me. I mean, you know, or at least like I would be open minded about that. But there, but there are. You know what I mean? And like that's the thing, though. They're not, they're not giving us what. I'm, they're not, a, they're not hitting my criteria to believe that there's a supernatural agency involved. But to the people who believe in them, they certainly are. All right. Well, I want to see these exorcisms. I just, I just, I just asked for five head spinning around videos. That's, that's, my, that's my limit. That's my criteria. By the way, sorry. Can I just ask Paul? When you were researching this stuff, did you ever come across those crazy teenage exorcists? <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh... Oh my god. I I strongly encourage you. I thought you must have seen it. But it's these three teenage girls, two sisters and, like, their best friend. And their dad is, like, this evangelical priest. And he, like, he's, like, they're, like, the exorcist team. And they, it's amazing. He wants to turn them into reality TV stars. And so, like, you used to be able to find a lot of their, like, uh, um, sizzle reels on YouTube and stuff. But, like, it is so crazy. This dad, just because of the dad in your book, you know, um, he, like, puts them in these, like, he, like, takes them to the Ukraine, because there's a big exorcism scene in the Ukraine, and he's taking them to these terrible, terrible, unsafe places. And, like, it's, it's really amazing. Definitely look it up if you haven't seen it. Yeah, to me, I mean, even as someone who writes horror, that's the stuff that just terrifies me is oh, other, yeah. other people. Like, those people just sound totally frightening, and those poor daughters. I mean, I will have to, to look uh. those up. Oh, can you imagine the dynamic, too, between those three girls? Because they all have to be very camera-ready at all time, and they're all very attractive. And, like, you know, they're, like, all very athletic. Like, he makes a big deal in one of the reels. I saw that they know martial arts. I'm like, <laughs> uh, because that's so useful in an exorcism. but um. But, like, can you imagine the dynamic between these three girls? Like, you know, uh, Sherry's not pulling her weight with the demon. You know, it's like, it must be so (laughs) crazy. Uh, I mean, that's the horror of reality TV right there. I mean, just... Oh, uh, God. Man. Hmm. Okay, so I also also want to ask you guys, I assume you all saw the trailer for the new Ghostbusters movie? Yes. And there's this scene where the woman is slapping the other woman in the face, and she says, the power of pain compels you out demon or something, out ghost, something like that. I was just wondering if there's any providence for the idea that you, you can get rid of a ghost by slapping somebody <laughs> in the face. There actually is. Um, you know, it, it's, there's um, the sort of like four stages of exorcism. There's like an opening. It's kind of interesting. It's like the stages of like meeting your therapist, right? So there's like the opening pretense where like the demon pretends that the person is not possessed. It's like, you're, and, then, and then there's like the breakthrough where the demon reveals itself and says its name. And then you can really get to like the next stage, which is like the battle, the clash, which is like, you take it on directly and like really wrestle with it. And then you expel it, right? You, it's the expulsion. Um, And so there are, and that's usually going from the pretense to the break point is usually where people will bring in physical torture. If they're not balanced people, Um, that's, That's where people will be like, I've got to force this demon to reveal itself, so I'm going to make my child drink a gallon of vinegar. Or, you know, and the pain will cause the demon to come forward. Or I've got to throw holy water on them or salt. Or um, I've got to, like, somehow subject them to physical extremity, like kicking them in the stomach. Um, There's a horrible case from California where a Korean woman was, like, basically kicked to death just being pounded, like stomped on her stomach over and over during an exorcism because they were trying to make the demon like reveal itself. 
Grady knows far too much about exorcisms. I think he might actually be a demon. I'm becoming a little, a little. Concerned. Where do you think I have to go at six? <laughs> but I, I, I think that that's a big part of why I find all of these exorcism narratives so horrifying. Is that a lot of times it is just plain abuse under yeah, the guise right. of we're helping you, and you know, Grady talked about you know the the little boy whose mounty father had him locked up um but you know a lot of the narratives are just you know teen girls and young women experiencing something um and then having men or you know intense mothers physically harming them for the good of their lives in theory um and i find that really disturbing that it's you know it goes back to you know hysteria back in the day of women having emotions must be the devil so let's beat it out of her oops she's yeah. dead now sorry but we won um it's just a woman right yeah, like... it, so i think that that's um part of what's so upsetting about these narratives and you know i think for me the the reason i don't i i don't watch them really anymore is because it's about lack of control uh, paranormal activity for me was much more upsetting because uh, the girl had no control over what she was doing in her sleep. And as a former sleepwalker, that freaks me out. Um, and I think that women these days are having control taken from them on all sorts of levels, uh, politically. Um, this is not my down with the patriarchy speech, but <laughs> I just think that there's the fact that so many of these stories are predominantly young women is telling and upsetting. And, you know, we need to look at why that's the narrative that is so embraced is, Oh, this girl's crazy. We got to put her through something horrific to save her when maybe all she needed was a good therapist. Right. And uh, to even look at it through just the lens of uh, pop culture entertainment, you know, that's something like, you know, I tried to sort of deal with in my book was, you know, and how, how does this become our entertainment? That this idea that, you know, these, you know, old white priests are coming in to, um, you know, do what they do to a 14 year old girl who is just, you know, be, you know, who has just gone through puberty and they're weirdly sexualizing her and sort of denying it at the same time, you know, and, and how can we find that so compelling as entertainment as well as sort of a, you know, an yeah. icky and tricky issue. Yeah. Well, I think you can blame the patriarchy directly. I mean, it's no mistake or, or no coincidence that the Catholic Church, which for all, however you feel about it, is a tremendously patriarchal institution, Absolutely. is the fount from which all exorcism flows. And that deliverance ministry, which is sort of the Protestant version, really came to prominence in the 60s and 70s when the women's rights movement was coming to prominence. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because it is a battle for control. And this is something that I think people who do exorcisms are very aware of. I mean, there's a in, in some Protestant circles, there's some a thing they call them pyromaniacs. And they say that, you know, people are there are some people who are drawn to this because they like the power and the confrontation. And what they're looking for is fireworks. They want the the rush, the fireworks, the sexy sizzle of the woman tied to the bed. And I'm screaming and she's vomiting and speaking in tongues and all this and I'm driving the demon out. And they actually, they call them pyromaniacs because they're attracted to what they call the fireworks, the sizzle. Yeah. No, I think I think actually what you guys were just saying, I think that's a pretty good note to wrap things up on because we're pretty much out of time. But I guess does that, if anyone has any final words, anyone have any final thoughts on possession? Save Grady. <laughs> Avoid it. You know, I was, no, save, yeah. save Grady, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, there is a troubling tendency in possession movies right now with demons' names. Um, you know, you had the older movies where they actually use demon names, like Pazuzu and stuff. And then now you have things like in Paranormal Activity, isn't the demon called, like, Toby? Yeah. Like, I just feel like we're hitting a point where eventually demons are going to be named, like, ah, I'm Jerry from Accounting. <laughs> like, it's just, I just, I would just... In, I would just urge anyone thinking of writing an exorcism book to please use real demon names and not name them like Jerry or Frank. All right. So I think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been speaking with Grady Hendricks, Jordan Hamilton London, and Paul Tremblay. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, David.
And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Grady Hendricks, Jordan Hammersley London, and Paul Tremblay for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Leonard Titangia, who just became PayPal patron number 136. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.